Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our series of conversations between Caleb Morpin and her pal Bra. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Korea. Um, there's a lot to say about Korea. We'll try and focus it on a few key questions, but I'm going to open up straight away by asking her pal to take us back really to the beginning of the modern story, which is the colonization of Korea at the beginning of the 20th century. So, her pal, do you want to start us off? Yes, very, very briefly. Um, the modern story of Korea starts really with the Sino-Japanese War of 1894, as a war between the dying Manchu dynasty and, and Japan. Japan won that, and as a result of that, as a result of the treaty that came at the end of that war, the Treaty of Samanenki, um, China was forced to cede uh, Taiwan to, 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 Japan, to Japan. But Taiwan was not in itself the sole aim. Eventually, it was to actually conquer Korea, which the Japanese had eyed for a very long time. Japan is bereft of natural resources. It was short of food, and Korea was very important for, from their point of view, to be able to get their hands on Korean ag agriculture. But Japan was not the only country that had its, its, its eyes on Korea. As Engels said about Ireland, the misfortune of Ireland is it was situated next to a big, powerful country. And this was one of Korea's misfortunes. There were many imperialist countries in the area trying to actually grab hold of Korea. And one of the other countries was, of course, the United States. And then there was the, Z Z Z the Russian Tsarist Zar 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 Empire. And eventually, uh, uh, the Japanese were not able to find any way of getting their hands on Korea, except by making sure that the Russians won't do that. And that is where they started the uh, Russo and Japanese war of 1904. It was a war that ended in the victory of Japan. It was a shock to the world in, at many levels. One, it was unheard of that an Asian country would defeat a powerful European country like, like Tsarist Russia. Tsarist Russia may have been backward, but it was a very powerful country and was a shock. And it was to be actually and the, become the prelude to the 1905-1907 Russian Revolution, about which both of you know very much and probably our audi audiences uh, do as well. But anyway, sticking ourselves to, to Japan, uh, Japan after the Russo-Japanese War, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Japanese then laid, laid, their, laid their hands on, on Korea. And that happened in the year 19, 1910. And within a few years, they turned it to, into a complete uh, colony. And they used its materials, its agriculture, for the purpose of fe feeding the, Jap the Japanese population. Japan was industrializing and it was very short of food and therefore they needed food and they got it from, 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 Korea, from Korea. But of course this didn't really uh, set, 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 settle the whole thing because as soon as that happened, the Japanese resisted, uh, the, sorry, the Koreans resisted that occupation and it led, led to a considerable amount of loss of life uh, that, the, that the Koreans suffered as, as, as a resu result, result of that. that. And uh, then, of course, the Americans were off, 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 after Korea as well. And the, the one way they settled was that the Americans agreed, at least at that time, that yes, the Japanese could have Korea, provided that the Japanese would recognize that the Americans had the right to uh, rule over the Philippines. And that was a settlement whereby the Americans were not liberators of, of Koreans or anything. They were actually the oppressors who were prepared to make a sacrifice of Korea in order that they could continue to have their mitts on, 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 on Philippines, which they had conquered along with Cuba after the American Cuban Cuban War. And uh, of course, that was an area in, in Asia that was close to Japan, 
and there was a danger that the Japanese would attack it. And the Americans were worried about it, and therefore they came to an agree agreement with them. That's how the conquest of Korea starts, and it carries on for another 35 years. Thank you. Caleb. Oh, well, that's a lot of very interesting history that I'm, I was not completely aware of. Uh, I do know that there is a kind of a, a, a blank spot on the part of a lot of us when we think about Japan. Uh, we just, in the West, we just think of Japan as a country in Asia. But to a lot of people in Asia and in the Pacific, Japan is a colonizer. Japan is an imperialist country. Japan is a brutal, brutal uh, country that has engaged in all kinds of horrendous crimes uh, against the people of Korea, against the people of China, against the, the people of the Philippines and, and elsewhere. And that's one thing that we kind of gloss over when I talk to folks from Asia often, you know, I mean, the, the, the understanding of the horrendous crimes of Japanese imperialism uh, is something that's people are very aware of in Asia, but we in the West kind of gloss over and forget. That's, it's very interesting you point to that, Caleb, because even today in Korea, despite the fact of the terrible crimes that have been committed against the Korean people by US imperialism, from what I understand from comrades who work in South Korea, the popular sentiment is still most strongly anti-Japanese than it is anti-American, precisely because those crimes are so committed over a long period, so deep in the psyche, and still not sort of accounted for or atoned for or accepted, acknowledged. You know, it's a, it's still a living wound in the, in the Korean people's memory, uh, some of the crimes of Japanese imperialism in Korea. Uh, and the fact that the, 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 the US requirement is for all of this to be swept under the carpet because they want a new alliance in that part of the world between the USA, South Korea, and Japan, and they want the they want the Koreans to forget about their animosity um, to the Japanese, and they're finding there's a lot of resistance to that. Yeah. Well, when the, when when the, when the Japanese came to Korea, they 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 were trying to portray themselves as industrializers of, of Korea. They would industrialize Korea and it would lead to a tremendous amount of prosperity. It didn't actually, because the Korean people were working something like 14 hours a day, and they were being actually exhausted to death as a result of long work, working hours. And then Japan not, took quite a lot of laborers from Korea in, into Japan, and so, some of their descendants can, continue to li li live there, and usually are treated as second-class citizens. And there's been a movement in, in, in Japan against their treatment in, in Japan. And that's a, a story, 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 story by itself. Then, the, of course, the Koreans remember that very much because the Japanese uh, actually forced close to 300,000 Japanese women into sex slavery. They were co called comfort, comfort women. Right. Comfort for whom? Comfort not for the women who were raped and subject, subjected to forcible se sexual slavery. It was comfort for the uh, for the Japanese Japanese so surgery. And the and the question still rankles um, with with the Koreans. It's a constant um, bone of contention, not only between the DPRK and and, and Japan but also between the, the, the Japanese and the puppet state that is, that is South Korea. South Korea is not an independent uh, uh, sovereign country. South Korea is an occupied country, occupied by the US ever since 19, 19, 1945. Before that by the Japanese and now by, by the Americans. The only part of Korea that is genuinely sovereign, that is free and free from occupation, that is, the, that is the DPRK. Although the story we will hear is complete, completely different in the West, that North Korea is run by a brutal dictate, dictatorship. It's a family, it's a dynasty, but they don't look at the achievements of, 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 the, of the DPRK. Even somebody like Joan Robinson, who visited North, the DPRK in the early 60s, said North Korea was a paradise. That, it's her expression, not mine. It was a, it was a paradise, and how 
really, really a level of equality had been achieved because what the Japanese did was that they just patronized few landowning families in, in Korea. They let they left the ever ever average peasant devoid of land, devoid of a mean means of earning a living. And so they recruited people who were their flank flunkies. They were of course treated as second class slaves, but much better than the ordinary people. And these are the people who would continue for a long time to serve imperialism. And that is true right up to today, their descendants. I mean, the only ones who, 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 who didn't manage to do that were those who were in the DPRK. It's very noticeable, isn't it? That even right through the period of the Republic of Korea in the South, i.e. the puppet state under occupation by US imperialism, has been run by a few families who are like a like a mafia and they pass the the title of leader between them you know if you if you have a few families who are who are the leadership that's not a dictatorship but if uh if you have relations close relationships between your leaders who come after each other that's definitely a dictatorship you know they have they have a funny way of of um of defining these things i just wanted before we before we come on to korea's liberation struggle I just wanted to make a small point that, that jumps out at me when I listen to and think about the, the early colonial history of Korea uh, and, and its relationship with Japan. And that is the relationship between Britain and Ireland during our Industrial Revolution. Right? You see exactly the same picture. You see Britain is rapidly developing its industrial base. Its cities are growing. Its industrial population is growing. It needs to feed those people. Ireland is the place just next door, very handily situated to provide food for the industrial population of Britain. Uh, it also provides second class citizens, second class labor, very, very cheap labor. They come over here. Marx wrote about it uh, and Engels in great detail about how it was the secret of the weakness of the British working class that they allowed this to be in their midst and they looked down on the Irish workers and allowed the ruling class to divide the working class in this way and, and that, that made them in fact impotent against their class enemies because that was allowed to continue but that relationship between you know the industrial colonizer and the colonized kind of agrarian state just next door country colony whatever is um is is exactly kind of similar isn't it So anyway, Dad, let's come on to the question of uh, the liberation struggle. So you've talked, I mean, right from the, from the word go, there was a strong liberation movement in Korea uh, once the Japanese occupation had been established in 1910. It's taken different forms at different times. And of course, as you mentioned, the North has achieved its liberation while the South is still a colony to this day, you know, 100 and you know, nearly 15 years after that. Uh, colonization by Japan. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about Korea's liberation struggle? Well, the, the Korean patriots struggled right from day one against, against the occupation. But the story of real resistance exacerbates with, with the emergence of, at that time, very young Kim Il-sung as, as a fight for, for, for liberation. And one way of doing those days was that the Korean uh, liberation fighters went across the border, they went into Manchuria, uh, and they fought along with their Chinese comrades against Japanese imperialism, which had started, started to con con conquering uh, China as well. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of help that the Koreans rendered the Chinese Revolution and the Chinese Revolution rendered to, 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 the, to the Koreans and they, 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 they fought, fought as, as, as comrades. And uh, then, then of course the Japanese conquered um, Manchuria and this established a puppet state called Manchugo, the state of, 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 the, of, the, of the Manchus. It was not an independent state, although nominally it was headed by, by, by local Chinese, but they were all puppets in, in, in the hand, hands of the, of the Japanese. 
and with the help of the Manchukuo state, they tried to suppress the liberation struggle of the Chinese as well as of the Koreans. And Kim Il-sung had become a legendary fighter for liberation, a, a, a guerrilla fighter. And the, and the Japanese spent a lot of resources, men and material, in order to capture him. They were not success, successful. And they recruited, of course, the Korean traitors, some of whom would later become very important in the so-called Republic, Republic of Korea. They were in, 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 into hunting Kim Il-sung. But then what happens, of course, is the Japanese, because of their contradictions with US imperialism, um, were in, 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 a, in a terrible state because Japan being bereft of natural resources, particularly bereft of tin, rubber, and especially oil, uh, which were of course controlled either by the British or by, by the Americans. And President Roosevelt, in order to put pressure on, on, on Japan, had cut off oil supplies to Japan, which was actually the main reason for the Japanese deciding that either they had to submit to US imperialism or gamble on attacking America. And that's when they attacked Pearl Harbor uh, and, and destroyed the American Pacific Fleet, which, which was stationed in, in Pearl Harbor. So that's what brought America into the war, not actually the desire to fight against the Nazis for liberation of people from, from fascism, but because they, they'd been attacked by, 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 by Japan. And once that had happened, then this, there's a Pacific War between the United States, States and Japan. But event, eventually, uh, by the time that the Second World War is coming to an end in the West, there's a, the, 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 there is a conference between the US, uh, USSR and, 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 and Britain. And it was d discussed at the Yalta conference as to what will happen to the Japanese in, in in, 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 in Korea and in China, etc. And as far as Korea was concerned, there was an agreement that three months after the end of the war in the West, uh, the USSR will enter the war against Japan, with which it had a treaty of neutrality, would enter the war uh, against Japan uh, al along with West, Western powers. And that is precisely what happened after the war ended. Three months after that, I believe it was on the 8th of August, 1945, um, that, the, that the USSR entered this war and the Red Army literally swept through Manchuria, defeating the Japanese and carried on all, all the way to, 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 to Korea. By that time, you have to remember, the Americans had already exploded two bombs on, Jap on Japan. Japan was ready to surrender, but these bombs were, were simply dropped for the reason that we've discussed before in, the, in, the, in this, this, this program. So both the American forces and the uh, Red Army headed into Korea and as had been agreed, I, I believe at the Yalta conference, the Soviet forces occupied north of the 38th parallel and the Americans south of, uh, of the 38th parallel. And the agreement was that there would be an attempt to let the Korean people in each region uh, sort out their own affairs, form their own, own government. Because as the Japanese are, are defeated, the Koreans are setting up people's committees, both in the north and south, south of the country. And the south of the country was not really under the control of America because the overwhelming sentiment of the population was with what Kim Il-sung was, was, was proposing. And so the agreement was that after five years, both the Red Army and the American forces would leave and the Koreans would hold a, a, a nationwide election 
and whichever government came to power, that would be had the new republic of of Korea. There would be the, the new state. Well, what happened was, after three years, in the in the northern zone, the Soviet Union didn't interfere with what the Korean patriots were doing, what Kim Il Sung was doing. They were setting up people's committees. They were involved in land reforms. Uh, land was given to the to the peasantry. This was the millennium old desire of the peasantry to acquire land, and they had never got it. They were given land, and anybody who had uh, more than 12 acres could not keep that. So the landlords who rolled both in the north and the south were deprived of their land in the northern part uh, of the Korean, Korean pen, Peninsula. But they were also given, if they wanted to cultivate, 12 acres of land as long as it was not in the same county from which they hailed, because otherwise they'd exercise undue influence over their former uh, tenants. So land reform was instituted and people's lives were made better. Laws were passed like working only eight hours a day as opposed to 13, 14 under, under the Japanese. And if the work was of a hazardous nature, it was seven hours a day. They were given two weeks of paid holiday, but if they were working in hazardous industries, it was four weeks paid, paid holiday, holiday every year. They were kindergarten, creche, schooling. Life was generally improved for, for, for the people in the north, but nothing of the kind was happening. Anyway, after having created a space, not interfering in internal affairs, it was the Koreans under Kim Il-sung who were doing everything in the north. The Soviet forces left at the end of 1948. The Americans did not leave and they're still there today. They, I mean, the, they have the biggest space right in the center of Seoul. You know, no other country has an American base in the middle of its capital, but the Americans have, have in South Korea, this independent sovereign country uh, that we are told, but it's actually an occupied country and it does everything, not even if it's reactionary ruling class doesn't want that. It actually is forced to do that which the Americans want. And they are being used constantly as a source of troublemaking on the borderline between the DPRK and, 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 and South Korea. It's not a borderline which is internationally recognized. It's not a borderline between two countries. It's a forcible division of one country imposed by the, by, 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 by the Americans. And it's the sincere desire and wish of the Korean people to have their country united and to be rid of foreign occupation, which they have had for, for so long, particularly since 1910. Thank you, Harpal. Caleb. Well, there's a lot, a lot there. I mean, that was a lot of ground that was covered. Uh, 1919, I know there was an event in uh, Korea called the White Robe Movement, and it was a kind of religious pacifist protest movement against Japanese occupation. And it was met with brutal repressive violence. Um, not only did they shoot down uh, the protesters who were marching against Japanese, uh, you know, colonialism, but on top of that, I understand that in retaliation for these, these widespread peaceful protests against the Japanese occupiers, they went and lit some schools on fire and killed a whole bunch of innocent Korean children that had nothing to do with the protests or anything just to retaliate. And that, you know, that that was a moment where um, a lot of uh, Korean folks that were involved in opposing Japanese colonialism, you know, became more involved in the the kind of the radical communist uh, circles because it was understood that there just would not be room for any other form of, of dissent uh, to Japanese occupation. Um, the other thing that I think I actually just wanted to wanted to ask Harpal about uh, is, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to talk about you know, it's the the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and this is a it's a it's a people's democracy, right? That was the formula that after the Second World War across Eastern Europe, uh, you know, the the these governments would come into power that were kind of a coalition of anti-fascist parties and forces. I know on the Korean Peninsula, you know, the Korean Workers Party is a merger of different political parties that were opposing Japan during the Second World War. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, in Romania and Czechoslovakia and East Germany and many places like that, you know, it was kind of a, a pe the people's democratic form of government. 
uh, which was this was kind of a, an innovation that I think came from Stalin largely uh, of how you could form kind of an anti-fascist coalition government with communists at the center of it. And the DPRK is an example of that. Uh, China, you know, is, is an example of that. So I was hoping that maybe Harpal could talk about the people's democracy uh, form of government. Well, it literally means that after the overthrow of feudalism and after the overthrow of foreign imperialism, the government that would come would not straight away be able to implement socialism, but it will institute democracy. And, and it, but it would not be the old kind of bourgeois democracy, it would be people's democ uh, democracy led by the communists led by the communists and work, workers' parties. And that's what, the, the, what, that's what the Koreans did. That's why they called their republic the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And even when they move on to the higher state, the name, of course, does not change any more than it has changed in the case of, case, case, case of China. But at that time, they had to sort out various problems which were really at the democratic stage. And the most important of the democratic reforms was not just only get rid of foreign occupation, but also giving land to the peasantry. That was the most important democratic demand. That is precisely why it was democratic. It was the demand of the majority of the people, it was the demand of the peasantry, which were the majority of the, of the, of the population. So for the first time, the peasantry received land free of charge. They didn't have to pay for it, they didn't have to buy it. They didn't have to pay any land revenue. They didn't pay, have to pay any, any money as tenants. In the old Korea, anywhere between 50 to 80% of the produce was handed over by the peasants to the land, to the land, to the land, land, landlords. But now you can see the freedom that people would enjoy once that happened. I come from a country where there was a large peasantry and you can see the joy in the eyes of a peasant if he acquires land free of charge. Of course, he hasn't done so in India, but that is what happened in countries like Russia first, China, uh, northern part of, of, of Korea. So that was a reform. Among the other democratic reforms, like um, making education available to ordinary people rather than being, being, being the remit of only the privileged classes, making sure that men and women could participate equally in productive and political activity. This could only happen by creating the facilities that would allow women. You know, you, you can pass a law that women are equal. That can be done on the very first day of, of, of a progressive government coming into being. But that does not bring equality to women because the subjugation of women lies in the fact that they are chained to the household, that they are chained to the nursery, chained to the chain to, to, to the to the to the to the to the, to the kitchen and so you have to create facilities by creating cheap facilities for cheap meals by creating facilities for kids to be looked after during work etc for there to be educational facilities and that is really what was done and that was definitely a case of democratic reform with the koreans put into effect very very quickly indeed far more than you would expect considering the conditions in which they founded themselves in 1945. Yeah, well, I have here, um, you know, this is from the, the Kim Il-sung's works, uh, the 20 point platform, uh, uh, you know, that the DPRK came to power on from the radio address, March 23rd, 1946. And I've often referred to this uh, when I'm, I've talked to people about revolutions and United Fronts because the 20 point platform of, of, you know, the, the people's Korea. I mean, it's, you read it, they're not, the demands in and of themselves, they don't sound like the most radical thing. I mean, you, you listen to what, what they were for, they're almost like, how could you disagree? But at the end of the day, they're reforms that do, you know, they're not reforms. They do cut at the heart of, of the society as it previously existed. I mean, it's, and it's just 20, 20 points. I'll read them really quickly. Um, thoroughly liquidate all remnants of Japanese imperialist rule wage an implacable struggle against reactionary and anti-democratic elements, grant entire freedom to, of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion, uh, see that the Korean people have the right to form their own people's committees, 
grant equal rights to all citizens in politics, regardless of sex, religion, or property status. Abolish all laws and judicial organs, which were remnants of Japanese imperialism. Develop industry, agriculture, transport, and trade for the enhancement of the people's welfare. Nationalize and encourage free activity and private handicrafts and trade. Confiscate all land belonging to the Japanese state, the Japanese traders and landlords who um, fix the market prices for living, living necessities to combat speculators and usurers. Institute a system of uniform, equitable taxation and progressive income tax. Introduce an eight-hour working day for factory workers. Uh, institute life insurance for factory and office workers. Introduce a system of universal compulsory education and widely increase primary and secondary school and colleges run by the state. Actively develop national culture, science, and the arts. Set up special schools on a wide scale for the training of personnel to be involved in state organs and in fields of national economy. Encourage scientists and artists in their work and give them assistance. And the last one is increase the number of state-run hospitals and stamp out epidemics and provide free medical care to the poor. That's the 20-point platform the DPRK took power on. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, it's, you know, that's that in and of itself. Like, if you were a person on the Korean Peninsula, who would be against such things, right? It's not like the most radical platform. It's not something that people have to completely change their whole worldview. But it's something that only only the communists in power, only a, a Marxist Leninist party in power could actually deliver. Um, and I, I feel like it's it, that's the kind of thing is they positioned themselves at the center of a coalition and they were able with their understanding of Marxism to, to give leadership to a movement that wanted what all the Korean people in their bones wanted. So that, that I often will refer to that 20 point program. I mean, I mean, what, 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 you, what you have read, the 20 point program, uh, 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 Caleb, is a, is a thoroughly democratic program. But long past other days, when this program of democracy could be delivered by the bourgeoisie, the, the last bourgeois uh, country that was to deliver that was probably Fran France. And in our own times, to a certain extent, I think my old friend Mugabe delivered it in Zimbabwe. You know, a lot of things, land reform, etc., bringing education, and bringing some health clinics, etc. Et now, af after the French, French Revolution, um, you know, soon after that, the bourgeoisie realized that it's not very good to attack private rights, even if they belong to feudal classes, because it's very infectious. The next class that is waiting in queue says, what about us? And they'd say, well, you know, let's nationalize industry. Let's do this, that, the other. Let's organize production slightly differently from the way it, it is done. So, I mean, they, they were, they were, they were people, bourgeois economists, like in your in your own country, Henry George, who were in favor of nationalization of land in, in America, but it didn't take place because the American ruling class understood that once you nationalize land. You're creating an infectious precedent where people would want the same with industry and every, 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 everything else. So the, that's why the democratic revolution in our times can only be really successful if it's led by the party of the proletariat. No other party, no other leadership can, can deliver, deliver that to, to, to the people. Uh, you can look all around the map, you can look at the map, and you will find that this, this is the case. Thanks, Apal. I think we should um, try and move on a little bit and uh, talk about the war, because obviously very few years after um, the liberation, so-called, of, of um, Korea from Japanese imperialism, um, as you said, Apal, the, the, the Soviet Red Army came as liberators. They didn't interfere in what the Korean people chose uh, how they chose to organize themselves and organize their lives. And they left in 1948. The forces who came supposedly as liberators in the South, the US uh, imperialists, they came as occupiers right from the beginning, uh, influencing and controlling and managing, micromanaging the life of uh, the people of South Korea who weren't able to express their will in the way the people of the North were. And very quickly, a new war broke out. So you know, they've been fighting for their liberation 
for decades. They finally, you know, in the north at least feel like they're achieving it. Uh, in the south, they haven't yet. But then there's a whole new war against those who have achieved liberation so quickly after they're fully independent. Um, the In the west, they just call it the Korean War. Um, the people of the DPRK call it the Fatherland Liberation War. Uh, three years of incredibly grueling, barbaric warfare waged against uh, the people of Korea. Four million, I think, people died in that war. The country was absolutely ravaged. The USA boasted that they'd bomb Pyongyang back to the Stone Age. It would take them a thousand years to rise again. You know, they're really proud of these genocidal achievements against a people who had had the temerity to just want to live their lives according to their own will and use their resources, you know, as they as they saw fit. So, Paul, do you want to talk to us a bit about that? Well, it's basically the question, really. There were two systems which were fighting uh, for hegemony over the Korean Peninsula. One was U US imperialism uh, with the help of its flunkies in Korea. The flunkies were all former agents of, of Japanese imperialism, agents of Jap Japanese uh, 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 occupation. And they, of course, as soon as the Japanese had been defeated, they transferred their loyalties, willingly or otherwise, to the new rulers, that, that, that is to the Americans. They wanted to keep the same old system of exploitation of the vast majority of the people by, 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 by a tiny, tiny minority. On the other hand, you've got a revolutionary example in the northern part of the country where people's committees are working well. And after the Americans um, had gone back on all the agreements that they had signed with, with the Soviet Union, that they would leave and the people could decide their own future. The, uh, they actually formed a government in the southern part of the country and called it Republic of Korea. It was only after that that the people's committees in the north uh, met and formed their own government and that became the Democratic People's Republic, Republic of, of Korea. But of course, they couldn't live for too long without any, any conflict because the Americans were there to make sure that the whole of Korea, Korea is really very important, not only for itself, of course it is an important uh, uh, country, but it occupies such an important position on the borders of, of Soviet Union, the borders of, of China, and the Americans obviously had every idea of turning on Korea into a base for rolling back the tide of revolution in China, the tide of revolution in, 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 in the USSR, etc. So they, they couldn't tolerate the existence of the northern part, which was very much allied, allied to the socialist camp, which was very much allied to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the Soviet Union. And for, for one reason or the other, they, they, they wanted to create problems. As far as the Korean War is concerned, the Americans, the imperialists and their flunkies and the South Korean puppets all say North Korea started by going over the border across the 38th parallel. There are two points I want to make. First of all, the DPRK say no, it's the South Korean puppets acted on by US imperialism who did that. Personally, if I have to make a choice who to believe, I believe the DPRK because DPRK has a long history of telling the truth. They're not in the business of telling lies. Secondly, even if the DPRK forces were the first to cross, where were they going? They were going into their own country. The, the 38th parallel is not an internationally recognized boundary between two countries. It's a temporary line drawn for the two different re, 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 regions of Korea. There's one thing on which the DPRK revolutionary leadership and the Korean puppets agree is that there is one Korea. The South Koreans claim the right to occupy the northern part of the country. They say it's an illegitimate regime. And the North Koreans say just the opposite. So if they were going across the boundary, they were going into their own country, who were they committing aggression? It's like really claiming that when Lincoln's forces crossed into the territory of the comfort raids, they were committing aggression against another country. Now, if you said that, you'd be laughed in your face 
including by U.S. imperialism. What are you talking about? It is a civil war in our own country. And that's precisely what was ha ha happening in, in, in Korea. So they were not actually crossing a boundary. They, they went there. Now, in my view, the South Korean puppets thought they'd have an easy run. They, they decided to attack the North. The Northern forces swept through the South and within three days, they'd occupied Seoul. And within about two and a half months, they'd liberated about over 90% of the southern, southern part of the country. And they would have been defeated in no time. And it is at that time that the American forces entered, and, entered Korea. They got a resolution passed at, at, at the United Nations, which was an illegal resolution because it required the union the vote of unanimous vote of all the five permanent members of the Security Council for the Americans to send their forces. But they didn't have the Soviet uh, representative present at the time because the Soviet Union was boycotting uh, the meetings of the Security Council because Security Council uh, a representative for China, permanent representative, was Chiang Kai-shek's government when they controlled nothing but for Taiwan, thanks to U.S. imperialism giving them support at the end of the, the, the Chinese liber liberation struggle, when Chiang Kai-shek's forces ran to, 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 to Taiwan, and they were representing uh, China, and the Soviets were obviously protesting against that. The Soviet, Soviet representative was not present. So the Americans said, well, there had to be a positively negative vote cost for the Security Council to have blocked it. And they took it to the United Nations General Assembly, which at that time was, time was dominated by the Americans, and got some resolution passed to send forces. So the Americans who pushed every one of their flunkies to wage that war, turn around and say, it's a war that is conducted by the United Nations, and they're sending their forces only in support of the United Nations. But nothing could be more of a travesty of truth, truth, truth than that. And the Americans then thought, well, they'll, they'll have an easy, e e easy time. And once they went in, they then pushed across the 38th parallel and came into North Korea, occupied large parts of it. And then as they were approaching Yalu River, which is a boundary between Korea and China, the Chinese had already said, if you, if you come near Chinese territory, we will enter the war. And that's what happened. The Chinese people, Mao Zedong sent the people's volunteers into, um, in, 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 into, into Korea to fight on, beha on behalf of the Korean people against US imperialism. And within a few months, the combined forces of the DPRK, the Korean People's Army, and the Chinese people's volunteers had pushed the Americans over the 38th parallel. And it was at that time that in his desperation, General MacArthur, who was in charge of, who was the head of the American forces, asked President Truman if he could use, oh, just about 50 nuclear weapons. Uh, and Truman said, no, it couldn't be done. Not because Truman was a lover of peace. He was the same person who had allowed two bombs to be dropped on, 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 on Japan. Because by that time, the Soviet Union had also acquired nu nuclear weapons, and there was a danger of a war with, with, with the so so Soviet Union. And so, really, the war should have ended once the Americans were pushed back to uh, beyond uh, the, the, the south of the 38th parallel. But the war carried on for another two years, during which time the Americans continued to bomb the northern part of the country, as well as part of of the South, because the people of South were not enamored of what the US and its puppets were doing. They were also rising in rebellion. And during the same time that they are fighting against the, the, the DPRK and the people's volunteers, they're also fighting against their own, own people. They killed hundreds of thousands of the people in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the South of the country. In the end, having realized they couldn't carry on anymore, an armistice was signed in 1952. And that's how the Korean War didn't end. A truce was signed, technically speaking, 
the US imperialists and their puppets are still at war with the DPRK. They've just taken a long break from that, that fight, 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 if you like. And, and that, that war was the first war that the Americans lost. There was no war before that that the Americans took part in it, which did not conclude with a treaty which declared the Americans to be winners, but they did not win. There was a hard lesson they had to learn. You can see why they have such burning hatred for the DPRK, why they have such a burning hatred for, for, for China. Japan is almost painted as a kind of, in the, in the, in the style of Buddha, peace-loving, he brings peace everywhere. The Japanese are brutal conquerors. You know, in Nanking alone, within a few days, they had killed 300,000 Chinese. In, in, in DPRK, if you go there, the Korean Communists will take you to various places where the Americans bombed within a week and killed 25,000 people. I've been to one of the museums, I believe it's in Sinchon County, my memory is not that good, where, where you sh were shown the kind of cruelties the Americans were committing. At one place, in, you know, there were women, Korean women incarcerated, and they were with their children, and in order to entertain their children, um, they were singing songs and the Americans had gasoline poured over that encampment and set it on fire. They were absolutely cruel. They were even more cruel than the, Jap than the Japanese. And yet the story is American and British are peace-loving Demo De Democrats. It's always the Germans in, in Europe and it's always the Japanese in Asia who committed atrocities but nobody can exceed the atrocities committed by Anglo-American imperialism. They really are monsters of the worst kind. Too true, Caleb. Well, I think it's also worth pointing out that, uh, that I mean, one of the main reasons that, that the war broke out was that originally there was supposed to be a, a peninsula-wide election of a constituent assembly uh, where every uh, every political party and every part of the Korean Peninsula would be free to elect delegates to write a unified constitution. But in the South, they would not allow uh, the, the Korean Workers' Party uh, to be part of uh, the writing of this new constitution. And that when the workers on uh, Cheju Island rose up uh, demanding their democratic rights, demanding the right to vote for the communists and, and to participate in the elections, that they were brutally slaughtered uh, and that there was a br brutal massacres of Korean workers in the South who were demanding their democratic rights and calling for uh, the entire peninsula to have uh, a free and fair election where the communists would be allowed to participate. And because the communists weren't able to join a coalition government uh, and then those who did call for such a thing were being slaughtered, it makes sense uh, that in the context of that, that uh, the, the folks in the North would feel an obligation to... Uh, to you know, protect their southern country folk. I mean, and um, you know, this this way it's always presented, as you as you pointed out, I, the way it's always presented is North Korea attacked South Korea, and it's like you have to remember this is one country, right? So that's the way we're always. Oh, North Korea attacked South Korea. That's that's just like that's just the way Americans have been taught to think about things. It's like we've been taught that there's this big, evil, scary place called North Korea. And so this big, scary place called North Korea attacked South Korea. It's like, no, this was one country that had been divided in the aftermath of the Second World War, which was very recent, was like one or two years prior to this. Um, and everything that we're told about why the Korean War broke out is just covered up. The other thing is that there is a, a documentary that I believe was shown on BBC uh, in the United Kingdom called The Unknown War that goes into great detail about the atrocities committed by the United States on the Korean Peninsula. They wouldn't show it on American television. They said American audiences couldn't handle it and that, that the American public has largely just they have just hidden the horrendous crimes that were committed by the United States against the Korean people. I mean, I mean, the details and I mean, the use of the bombing of the dikes to create flooding and the, the torture of prisoners and and just I mean, the the horrendous atrocities that were committed during the Korean War, uh, you know, by U.S. forces. Uh, I mean, they, they the world knows about it, but the American public doesn't know about it and hasn't come to terms with it.
The other thing that I, I find to be beautiful and inspiring is that I, I remember when I was first, you know, when I was like a teenager, first getting involved in communist politics, there was an older woman who had been in the Communist Party USA. Uh, and she remembered when she was very young, the protest movement against the Korean War. People know about the protests against the Vietnam War. But in the United States, there were some isolated protests against the Korean War. The Communist Party was basically illegal at this point. It was functioning underground because of McCarthyism. But, you know, she was a nurse and, uh, you know, she was working as a nurse at a hospital. And she told us the story of someone came to her and said, you know, at Times Square in New York City at this time, there's going to be a, a protest. So just be there and, you know, kind of gave her a message. And she and other people, they gathered in Times Square and people were wearing suits and ties and just kind of standing around. And then someone shouted a code word and then they unfurled a very big banner that said, you know, uh, peace on the U.S. troops out of the Korean Peninsula. And immediately the police came down on them and started beating them. So they, they split apart and then they they reconvened at 34th Street at, at Madison Square. And again, they waited until someone shouted a code word and then they unfurled their banner and then the police came down on them and they did this all through Manhattan. And they were functioning as almost an underground organization. A lot of their members were beaten up and arrested, and they it was they they could barely have this protest against the Korean War. Uh, the other thing is that the writer Howard Fast, uh, who was at that point a member of the Communist Party, uh, in order to support the Korean people, he rented a hotel room facing Times Square in in New York City, uh, and he got big speakers, and they blasted out uh, anti-imperialist messages into Times Square, you know, over big speakers, and the police were scrambling, trying to figure out where that where it was coming from, trying to figure out what hotel room was was blasting this out and that, that this was how the Communist Party USA had to function. But they understood that they had to show solidarity with their Korean comrades. And even though they were functioning as a, as a basically illegal underground organization amid McCarthyism, they still managed to protest the Korean War. And that as the Korean War went on, there was increasing dissension among the U.S. soldiers. I mean, the U.S. military, even you know, they, they had just had the Second World War and there were a number of, of U.S. soldiers who didn't want to didn't want to be there. And and part of the reason the USA ultimately signed the armistice uh, and, and you know, and and pulled it, pulled its forces back and, and went back to the 38th parallel was because within the US military, uh, there was increasing dissension. To this day, North Korea is the only country in the world that has ever captured a US army general. Now, there have been other generals that have been captured uh, by different countries, uh, generals of the Marine Corps, gen uh, admirals in the Navy. But the only country that's ever captured a U.S. Army general is North Korea. And I actually have read the the autobiography of that general, uh, and it's fascinating. He speaks very, uh, very, very glowingly. He says that he learned a lot from his Korean captors. Uh, and he talks about how they made very good points about how in uh, how in capitalism, uh, you know, labor unions try to Try to fight against automation because you know technological advancement leads to greater poverty, and this was a very good point that was made. And he talks about what it was like to be held as a as a prisoner of war, and how they made a big point of trying to teach him Marxism, and how he actually learned a lot about Marxism from his captors. So, so you know th that whole story is important, and it's important to know that you know in the United States we think of the Korean War as just ancient history. It's not ancient history on the Korean Peninsula by any means. It is considered to be a very, very relevant current event. They all know that history and they are locked and loaded, son gun, military first. They are ready. If the Americans come again, they will fight them on every mountain and every village and every rock. They are they know what happened uh, and they they know why they had big problems in the 1990s due to, you know, due to the sanctions and the arduous march period and the Korean people know their history very, very well, and they're ready to have another Korean War if they have to. And that's why the U.S. imperialists, uh, you know, are, are at this point. I mean, that's why they haven't invaded. They would like to have invaded them. They were the axis of evil with Bush. Uh, you know, they've had troops on the Korean Peninsula, but but they know. I mean, they have done military assessment with their satellites. They know that the fight, a fight on the Korean Peninsula would not be a war they could very easily win. You bring us to a really important point there, Caleb. But just before I come come back to it do you know can you remember the name of that general whose book you were talking about i i think uh yeah it's uh uh it's william f dean and i i, I will just stand up his book is right over here I, I i think it's dean yeah okay i'm just writing that down <laughs> everyone yeah, who's yeah, listening general, you've got a moment general to write william f dean this is his autobiography of how he was held you know general by the north koreans story. william f dean 
yeah. that's how like a book worth reading you know these are the type of these are the ways to get your history people you know yeah from people who were there and who've seen something that's that's worth knowing about um coming back to this question about the korean the north korean the people of north korea their preparedness for war uh you know we again have to come right back to the question of the armistice right since 1953 they have lived in a situation where there is a truce but not a negotiated peace. They have performed all of the miracles that they have performed in their country to, to rebuild the country that had been so destroyed by US bombing that the, you know, the, the, the US was bragging it would take them a thousand years. It didn't at all. You know, the, they built Pyongyang in particular into a beautiful city, but you know, they reconstructed their entire country, their industry, their agriculture, you know, all of their state services, hospitals, schools, all the rest of it. Um, they've done that uh, not only, you know, with the constant threat of war hanging over them. And so preparing to defend their country against further imperialist attack has been at the core of everything they've had to do. And yet they've made all of these achievements. You know, at the time when the Soviet Union collapsed, they had the terrible situation of finding that their main trading partner in the world was gone and they were underneath a tremendously strangulating economic blockade from the West, and yet they held on to their socialism and continued to find ways to build and continue to develop their self-defense machinery to the point where now the USA is actually terrified about the military capabilities of North Korea that, that at the same time as building a socialist society, socialist industry, socialist agriculture, schools, children's palaces, you know, all the achievements that the Korean people have, they have been able to develop the technology to compete with and defeat imperialist armies of aggression. And that's a very tremendous thing. And we don't hear enough about what it really means that they can do that. You know, the, the people know how to fight, they know how to use weapons. And that means that they're able to, to mobilize a humongous army if they have to. They prefer not to, but they're ready if they have to. And um, they have weapons now that mean that the threat of nuclear war goes two ways. They now have you know, the ability to, to, to take their weapons all the way over to the US mainland, which completely changes the dynamic between the two uh, powers. When, they, when the US is threatening, the DPRK can stand its ground and say, Anything you can do to us, we can do to you. And in fact, they're starting to develop, develop weapons that the USA doesn't have, right? They have those hypersonic missiles that Russia and China also have, and the US, Britain, the imperialist countries don't have. So they've really built this defensive capability, which is so important. And that, of course, is why they're constantly screamed about as being aggressive, right? But I remember talking to a lady from Korea years ago uh, asking, she she had lived for, for various reasons in many countries in the world. And I said to her, well, which was your favorite? And she said, North Korea. And I said, why is that? You've seen a lot of places. She said, my country is so peaceful. You know, the atmosphere in which people live is calm, is civilized, is, is humane. And so she says, when she goes home, she always felt that sense of inner peace, being somewhere so peaceful. And yet that inner peace that they have provided for their people is provided, you know, there's a kind of contradiction is provided in this circumstance of the constant threat of war hangs over them. And when you look at the war games that are going on in, in South Korea right now, they are the imperialists are ratcheting, ratcheting up the tensions to a his hysterical level and constantly constantly rehearsing the invasion and nuclear attack against and decapitation of the leaders of North Korea. And every time they mobilize these humongous joint, joint exercises, the DPRK has to put itself on a war footing because it might turn into a real one, you know, Papa. Well, before I comment on what you said, Jyoti, um, I just want to say the difference between the two, two systems can be gauged from the fact that after their liberation in the northern part, the DPRK created thousands of schools, hospitals, and factories uh, that produced for the working working people of Korea. And during the American war against the north of the country, they destroyed over 7,000 factories, over 6,000 schools, <coughs> 
over a thousand hosp hosp hospitals among among others. You know, it's a country that has sacrificed so much to build these. And the American achievement, and they boast about it shamelessly, is that we didn't leave anything standing there. We bomb, bombed them. And it's to the credit, in fact, the glory of the DPRK, that after that devastating and destructive war, they were able to build all that and they provide education to their kids that is not available in the so-called free south, south, south of the country. They provide health facilities to their people which are not available. Even in the United States, they provide kindergartens and, and crash and facilities for looking after, after children. If you go to a North Korean school, kids are cultured. They're not singing yob yob rubbish. They're singing beautiful songs. They're, they're cultured. They can, everybody can play some instrument. Almost everybody can say, can, can actually sing. I think it was, I was born in North Korea, even I could probably learn to sing. And, and, and it's always true of the socialist countries. That's what they do. They look after the welfare of the people. And that's why they're hated. But why are they hated? Because they look after the people. Because the system, imperialism, is a man-hating, I use it in the, in the way human beings are. It's a man-hating system. It's a man-eating system. Human beings mean nothing to them. All that matters is making profit and maximum profit, profit, profit at, 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 at any, any given time. And the difference is that whereas the Korean people fought for their liberation, as soon as the imperialist forces defeat their rivals like Japan, in, in, in Germany, in, 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 in the West, although Germany was defeated mainly by the, by, by, by the Red, Red Army, uh, or the Japanese defeated in, in Indochina. First thing they do is they mobilize the defeated countries' armies in order to suppress the local population. This happens in Vietnam, that happens in, in Indonesia, where the British and the French forces land. And what do they do? They restore the old regime and, and, and start fighting against the very people who have fought against, against J J Japanese imperialism. The same thing they, they, they do in Korea. All the traitors, have you heard of a, um, a South Korean president, Park Chung-hee? He, he, he was a South Korean agent of Japanese imperialism. But of course, once Japan was defeated, all these people were enlisted into the South Korean puppet army and the South Korean na 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 national police, where, which they used to terrorize their own people, kill people by the hundred, hundreds of thousands, imprison people, people who went to jail for basically praising the northern part of the country, spent 20, 30 years in jail for no other reason that they actually um, violate the so-called national security law, which says you cannot actually praise North Korea. You cannot have any dealings with North Koreans. Why not? They are their brethren. Why can't they have dealings with the with, 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 with North Korean? But, but that's precisely uh, uh, what, what they did. And to the extent there is any industrial development, it's helped by the US, both in Japan as well as Korea because it was clear after the Second World War, communism was very popular. If countries were left to themselves, several countries in the world would have gone communist, including Japan, including France, uh, and of course, Korea, there's no, no question about it. China, China did, did go communist, North Korea did, did go. There was such an allurement because the communist program is such, it appeals to ordinary people, which, ordinary peasant doesn't want land, which ordinary worker does not want education for his ch children, which uh, woman working in a factory does not want a creche or a kinder kindergarten. The program that was put forward by the communists, by the gov revolutionary governments was so alluring that America could not trust people to have a vo vote. Their idea was to change the electorate they couldn't change the electorate in the circumstances, so they had to 
suppress everything. And they did that at tremendous human cost. So millions of Koreans had to pay with their lives, as indeed the Vietnamese, as indeed the in Indonesians, to finally actually free themselves from the tutelage of American imperialism. And in some cases, they're not free. Like in the southern part of Korea, they're still occupied by the US. And the US keeps on saying every time, oh, North Koreans are aggressive. Why? They're aggressive because they're developing nuclear weapons. Now they tried for years to come to an agreement with America that they won't develop nuclear weapons provided because they were short of electricity, they were short of uh, these resources. And the Americans would, would, would help them with oil supplies uh, as well as nu nuclear power, which would not be capable of producing nuclear weapons. But the Americans reneged on every agreement that they signed. So what do you expect the, the, the North Koreans to do? They had to then take no for an answer and get on with developing the weapons of self-defense. The main thing is you can keep, they can keep on calling North Korea aggressive. Which country has North Korea invaded? Which country has North Korea gone to? America has 800 bases around the world. America invades every country. In the morning, they get up. The American rulers say, now which country shall we invade today? But of course, they have overextended themselves. They overreached themselves. Everywhere they're distrusted. Their do dollar hegemony is going to break because anybody who puts money in dollar reserves stands to lose it. They confiscate them. They're thieves. I mean, you know, if I steal a bag of peanuts from a supermarket, I'll be prosecuted and put in jail for six months. These people steal hundreds of billions of dollars at a time. They have stolen even $300 billion from Russia's sovereign wealth fund, which was in, in, in deposited with American financial institutions. And people have learned now, don't put your money in American banks. And even countries that have been flunkies for 60 years of America, like Saudi Arabia and the little state, let's call the U UAE, they're actually beginning to diversify their comm commerce as well as their, their financial dealings. But things are not going well for Uncle Sam. But of course, it's a very powerful country. It's on the decline. And because it's on the decline, it's very da dangerous. So the world has to live with this dangerous enemy. But make no mistake, they will be defeated. Kim Il sung never lost sight of the fact that in the end, Korea will be united and Korea will be free. He even said in his uh, uh, autobiography with the century, he said, it may take 300 years. He said, so what? It took India 200 years to achieve freedom from British colonialism. It took 300 years for the Indonesians to get their freedom. It took nearly 100 years for the, for the Vietnamese. It might take a long time for the Koreans to achieve their unification and freedom, but they will make no mistake about it. He had such firm belief in the final liberty and liberation of the Korean people and defeat of US imperialism. And that's what gave him the strength. That's what gave him the status that he had in world, world politics. We have to probably end, end here. Um, do you want to make some concluding remarks, Jyoti? And then I have to I have to cut this off. Yeah, I was about to come to you for closing remarks, Caleb, but I just wanted to come back on what Papal said there, that this, this reminder for those who get pulled in by the propaganda. You know, number one, this highlights again and again things we're learning today about how the US, the imperialists are agreement incapable, right? They sign pieces of paper when they have to, but as soon as they feel able, they renege on every agreement they ever sign up to. So you can't trust them. They're bandits. The only language they understand is the language of force. And these people who claim to love democracy have spread carnage around the world, drowning the people's democratic will in blood in every corner of the world. Dad, you name some of them, but you know, also Greece, Italy, um, you know, uh, Vietnam, obviously, Indonesia, you know, everywhere you look, you see revolutionary upsurges being crushed so brutally uh, because the will of the people doesn't fit with the will of, the, of imperialism. Great. 